This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. In the first half of December, delegates from 187 nations came together at the 2007 United Nations Climate Change Summit in Bali, Indonesia. Their goal was to come up with a globally acceptable agreement to cut back greenhouse gas emissions, which would replace the Kyoto Protocol that expires in 2012. The United States, one of the biggest CO2 emitters on Earth, refused to accept language in a draft document the proposed industrialized nations consider cutting emissions by 25 to 40 percent over the next 12 years. The European Union favors that text, but the U.S., Canada, and Japan argued the proposal is too limiting. Angered and frustrated by the American position, European Union leaders threatened not to show up at the Bush administration's global warming conference in Hawaii plan for January 2008. Nobel Peace Prize winner and speaker Al Gore acknowledged before the Bali delegates that America was the biggest stumbling block to a new global commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Sadly, of the nations that did ratify the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, nearly half failed to meet their CO2 reduction targets. The two-week-long Bali conference would have concluded without any global consensus to curtail greenhouse emissions, but delegates stayed up all night after the conference was supposed to have ended Friday, December 14th, and proposed two compromises. Finally, the United States said, quote, We will go forward and join consensus, unquote. Earlier boos against the American delegation then turned to cheers. The final draft for a so-called roadmap of global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions dropped explicit mandatory reduction goals of 25 to 40 percent, which the Bush administration resisted. Voluntary reduction goals are now requested. Further, instead of guaranteed technological help and monetary incentives to cut back greenhouse emissions as China, India, and other developing nations wanted, the U.S. and major industrial nations will consider incentives. This Bali draft will evolve through more meetings into a 2009 final agreement to replace the 1997 Kyoto Pact, which expires in 2012. Meanwhile, the Earth continues to heat up. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina, reports that the average global surface temperature for 2007 is expected to be the fifth warmest since records began more than a century ago. 2007 will also be the eighth warmest year on record in the United States. Seven of the eight warmest years globally on record have occurred since 2001, and the ten warmest years have all occurred since 1997. Since 1976, the global average surface temperature rate of increase has been approximately three times faster than the previous century. The greatest warming has taken place in high-latitude regions of the Northern Hemisphere. In 2007, the Greenland ice sheet melted nearly 19 billion tons more than ever before, and by the end of summer, the Arctic Sea had another record meltdown— NASA climate scientist Jay Zwally said, quote, At this rate, the Arctic Ocean could be nearly ice-free at the end of the 2012 summer, much faster than previous predictions, unquote. Climate scientists everywhere were surprised by the rate of Arctic sea ice melt in 2007. The Associated Press summarized the record-shattering Arctic and Greenland meltdowns this way. More surface ice melted in Greenland than ever before, 12% more than the previous worst year of 2005. 552 billion tons of ice melted, according to satellite data, and that's 15% more than the annual average Arctic summer melts 
have ever been. Arctic sea ice melted away to nearly 23% below the previous record melt, opening up the Northwest Passage to ships. That forced 6,000 walruses to come ashore in northwest Alaska in October for the first time in recorded history. The remaining Arctic sea ice was also the thinnest on record. Combining the shrinking sea ice with such thin ice means, the overall volume of Arctic sea ice was only half of what it was only three years ago in 2004. Alaska's frozen permafrost is also warming up. All the way down 66 feet, the soil heated up about half a degree between 2006 and 2007. As permafrost warms and melts, methane will be released into the atmosphere, adding to the greenhouse blanket around the Earth. NASA scientist Jay Zwally says, quote, It's getting even worse than the models predicted, unquote. And now, in the December 14, 2007 issue of the journal Science, chemical oceanographers report that carbon emissions from human activities are not only heating up our planet, but the ocean chemistry is changing so much that if the CO2 buildup continues at the current rate, by the year 2050, no coral reefs will be alive. That's only 42 years from now. What's happening between the oceans and the increasing CO2? About one-third of the carbon dioxide that goes into the Earth's atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans. The absorbed CO2 produces carbonic acid. Unfortunately, carbonic acid dissolves away the skeletons of planktons, shellfish, and coral reefs. Why? Because the skeletons are made from carbonate minerals such as aragonite in seawater, that are being greatly reduced by the increasing CO2 production of carbonic acid. Currently, the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere is measured at 383 parts per million volume. By the middle of this 21st century, that number could double to 766 parts per million volume. More conservative estimates are 550 parts per million volume by the year 2050. One of the coral reef research scientists is Ken Caldera, Ph.D., and chemical oceanographer at the Carnegie Institution for Science in Stanford University's Department of Global Ecology. He and his colleagues say, quote, If atmospheric CO2 stabilizes at 550 parts per million, and even that would take concerted international effort to achieve, no existing coral reef will remain in such an environment, unquote. So even the most conservative estimate for CO2 in the atmosphere by 2050 is still too much for coral reefs to survive in the world's oceans. I talked with Professor Caldera about this latest research and the implications for our future. I think we can expect that coral reefs will not be found on this planet sometime uh, later this century if current greenhouse gas emissions continue. Something that's been here many millions and millions of years for us in a few decades to wipe them all out is pretty dramatic. Also, there are tiny marine organisms that live on the surface of the ocean. Plankton? The plankton that make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. So it's really imperative if we want to preserve our marine environment, that we really have to bring down CO2 emissions very rapidly. And according to the Carnegie release, the projection is that by 2050, which is only 42 years from right now, that the atmospheric CO2 level is projected to be 550 parts per million, which is the focus of your study, meaning 42 years and the conditions in the oceans could be such that no coral reefs could survive? Yes, uh, I think that is correct. The last time that similar conditions are known to have existed in the ocean is uh, 65 million years ago after the dinosaurs became extinct. There was an ocean acidification event, and corals and plankton that make their shells out of calcium carbonate disappeared from the geologic record. And it took about 2 million years for corals to come back and repopulate the coasts 
can be common once again. And so it's entirely likely that as a result of our policy decisions over the next decades that we will be affecting the life in the oceans for millions of years to come. Our model suggests that the chemical recovery of the ocean will occur over some tens of thousands of years, which is plenty long enough, but the biological recovery timescales seem to be much longer. And that's provided that humanity and its industrial civilizations would pull back on CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, say a doubling of pre-industrial CO2 levels to something like 550 or 560. From a climate point of view, some people look at that as a goal and and an acceptable target. But from the point of view of oceans, it will produce ocean chemical conditions that have not been seen for many tens of millions of years, which is much longer than the amount of time the average species has been around. So we'll be producing ocean chemical conditions that the species that now live in the ocean have never experienced. And will they be able to adapt to it? Maybe. Will they not? We don't really know how ecosystems will respond. But the acidification is getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, eventually, even if we do everything right on the other kind of management practices, the acidification alone will be enough to kill off the coral reefs. What do you say to people who argue, well, uh, 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were here, there was no ice at the Antarctic or the Arctic, and the CO2 levels were up around 1,000 parts per million. When the dinosaurs were around 65 or 100 million years ago, it's thought that volcanoes were putting out carbon dioxide about twice what they are today. But our carbon dioxide emissions from burning of coal, oil, and gas are around 50 times the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of volcanoes. And if we were only doubling the natural CO2 fluxes, then the chemistry of the ocean would be able to deal with that and adapt to it. But when we're putting out carbon dioxide 50 times faster than natural sources, it just overwhelms the ocean's natural ability to buffer its chemistry. And so we're just doing, we're putting in the CO2 way, way too fast for the ocean to be able to deal with it. So the rapidity of this is what separates right now the 20th to the 21st centuries from, say, 65 million years ago and back in the time of the dinosaurs. Yeah, and even if you go back to the ice ages, we all see these figures where the CO2 is going up and down with the ice ages. But right now, the rate of increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 100 times faster than the increase in CO2 at the end of the last ice age. So our... CO2, the change in atmospheric CO2 is extremely unusual, even when viewed from a geologic perspective. You have to go back, I mean, the argument among geologists is you have to go back 55 million years or 65 million years to find a similar event. There have been all of these representatives from so many countries in Bali discussing the whole issue of how to control CO2 and other greenhouse emissions. And right now it's clear that the United States and China do not want to sign PACs having to do with restricting CO2 emissions to certain standards that other parts of the world are saying, let's do this together. If China and the United States, the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, do not agree to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, what do you think the worst case is for, say, the year 2050, only 42 years from now? We did a calculation for how fast ecosystems would have to move to keep up with climate change this century, and ecosystems would need to move about 10 meters a day, it's about 30 feet a day, just to keep up with the temperature bands as they move towards the poles. And, you know, just things like oak trees cannot move 30 feet a day. Maybe windborne weeds can move at those kind of rates. What we're doing to this planet is extremely unusual, even when viewed from a geologic perspective. It's not like this is the kind of thing that's happened to the planet many times. I mean, what we're doing is well outside the bounds of normal climate or chemical variability in the ocean. When you change the environment very quickly, you just need one link in that chain not to be able to make it, not to survive, and then that whole uh, system falls apart. And 
the further sort of nightmare scenarios have to do with collapsing ice sheets and then methane being released from permafrost in the, as it melts in the Siberia. And, you know, there's no end to uh, what could possibly go wrong scenarios. And that this could be the last generation to have known the Earth as it has been, say, for the last 5,000 years? Yeah, or you could even say coral reefs have been on this planet since uh, pretty much continuously for the last, say, 63 million years the reefs were around. And so, you know, what we're doing, they've been around for our entire evolutionary history. And so for us, in this blink of an eye, to be destroying what we co-evolved with over so many years, it's really dramatic. And tragic. And tragic. Professor Caldera and his associates are so concerned about the extinction potential of all the planet's coral reefs that this coming summer of 2008, he and his team will be at the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia to see if they can directly measure ongoing carbonic acid damage to the huge coral reef and at what rate the coral will probably die over the next four to five decades. Beyond coral reef extinctions and the marine life that might die off as a consequence of losing those ocean houses, Dr. Caldera told me, quote, I guess my nightmare scenario for humans is what would happen as climate changes, rainfall patterns shift, and the places we now rely upon for growing food are no longer able to sustain the kind of population we have on Earth. There is a potential for widespread famine. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. Earthfiles.com